I've built a tool called Live Coding in Python. It lets you run your Python code as you type it. For example, this code draws a 100 by 100 pixel square. When I change the forward distance to 200, the square immediately changes. I don't even have to save the file. In this tutorial, I'll demonstrate three things. Live Turtle graphics that make a fun learning tool, a live coding display that can be used with regular code to show you what's happening inside it, and finally, live unit tests. To try it yourself, visit donkirkby.github.com. To see it in action, watch this video or read the tutorial on the website. Python already comes with a turtle module, so what's the difference? If we turn off the live coding and save the code and run it, this main loop will open a window with the turtle graphics in it. Every time I make a change to the code, I need to change the code, save it, and run it. Of course, I don't do that after every change. Instead, I predict the result by running through the code in my head. One of this project's main goals for live coding is to let programmers' brains focus on writing code instead of running code. If you can see the code's result laid out in front of you, then you don't have to hold it all in your head. Still, I sometimes like to run the regular turtle graphics to see the animation of the turtle moving through its logic. The same turtle code will run in live coding mode as in the regular turtle window. Another benefit to live coding like this is that I can be creative in a different way by reacting to the results of my changes. How about an example? When I first added the feature for filled polygons, I played around with it by drawing squares, and triangles, pentagons. Then I tried drawing a star. I was surprised that the center of the star wasn't filled in. But after I thought about it, I realized that when you draw a star this way, the center is actually outside of the polygon. That gave me the idea to try drawing a spiral around the star. So I went around the star five, five times and then made the distance slightly longer each time it went around. That, that was interesting, it's a stripy star. I tried going around the star 50 times and the star filled the screen. Then I had the idea to make a small change to the angle and see what happened. The result kind of blew my mind. I didn't set out to draw a pinwheel pattern and work out how to achieve that. I just stumbled across it while exploring how filled polygons work. When you combine live coding's rapid response with an intuitive interface like Turtle Graphics, it's easier to learn and create with. I think that was Brett Victor's point in his Inventing on Principle video that inspired me to build this tool. That was the fun learning tool. Now what can you do with real code? I did create a turtle class that writes to PDF, so that will let you use turtle graphics in a few more situations. But the main feature is a different view that helps you visualize what's happening inside your code, so you don't have to keep running it in your head. I'll start with a trivial chunk of code that assigns a value to a variable and then changes it. Now, that's pretty easy to tell, to step through it in your head and to see that this is now hello world. Remember, though, that I want to let your brain focus on writing code instead of stepping through it. I open the live coding display, and on the right-hand side, you can see that S is hello, and then S is hello world. Now let's do something more interesting and write a search function that searches through a sorted array and finds the index of the number you're looking for. We start out with a bad search function that never finds anything, but let's see how it works when we call it.
you can see the input parameters at the top of the function and the return value at the bottom. We'll start looking for the value in the array and the first place to look is the middle item. We can calculate what the index of the low end of the array is and the high end and then the middle item. Then we check to see if the number we're looking for is in the middle. That was lucky. We've, it was in the first place we looked. And you can see the calculations as it goes. On the left, you see an abstract formula in the code, like high equals the length of a minus one. And on the right, you see a concrete value, high equals two. However, a search function usually won't find the item we're searching for on the first try. Let's ask for an item earlier in the list. And then we'll search for it using a while loop. We'll use a variable to hold the number we're looking at. And then if it didn't match, we decide whether we're going to look in the lower half or the higher half of the array. If the number we're looking for is less than the middle number, then we have to look in the lower half. So we move the high end down to just below the mid. All right, now the loop runs twice, adding a column each time it runs. And you can see the calculations as it goes through each iteration of the loop. That's a good example of how this tool differs from a debugger. With a de debugger, you're always looking at a single moment in time. Here you can see the whole history of the search laid out on the screen. And you move back and forth through time just by moving your eye. It's a lot like the difference that makes static visualizations of sorting algorithms easier to follow than animated sorting algorithms. Now let's look for an item later in the list. If n is not less than v, then it must be greater. And in that case, we want to look at the high end of the list. So we move low to be mid plus one. Oops, I get an index error. Without the live coding display, I would just get a traceback that shows where the error happened, but not how it happened. Now I can walk back from the error to see where things went wrong. Mid is the index value, and it's calculated at the top of the loop here. The two values that go into it, low and high, are both two. So they should average to be 2. Ah, I needed to use parentheses to do the addition before the division. What happens if we try to find a value that's not in the list? I guess that, that while true wasn't such a good idea. We're struck, stuck in an infinite loop. If you want to see some later loop runs, you can scroll over and see that it just keeps going and going. From the third run on, the values in the loop don't change. So we probably want to exit from the second or third run. If you look at the end of the second run, 
you can see that high is now lower than low. That means that we've searched all the way from both ends to meet in the middle, and it's time to give up. At this point, I think I'm done. I can add a few entries and search for them to make sure everything is working. Zero, one, two, three. Uh, also, if this were a real library module, I wouldn't want to execute a call at the end of the file like this. So I can, uh, so I only do it when I'm in live coding mode. Now that will only run if you're in live coding mode. The live coding display is also available in Emacs. I'm going to switch over to Emacs now and then open up the file we were just working on and launch the live Fi mode. You can see it's got a very similar display over on this side showing what happens as the code runs. If you change the input, it changes the display. If you change some of the code, it'll break. So the uh, function is very similar to what you get in Eclipse. If you want to see all of the uh, features available just hit uh, control H M for the mode help and then choose the live pi mode hit enter on that and you can see all of the controls that are available special thanks to several Emacs users who contributed most of the code for the Emacs mode I've also started working on a PyCharm plugin with a live coding display so let's switch over to PyCharm you can see that it's very similar. It's got the code on the left and the display on the right. If I change the code, then the display updates. I'm just starting work on this, so it's still pretty rough, but get in touch if you'd like to help contribute and build that into all the features that you see in the Eclipse plugin. Now let's go back to the Eclipse plugin. All through that search function example, I kept changing the parameters to search for different items in the list. I think that each set of search parameters would make a nice unit test, and I think unit tests help you write better code. So I'm going to show you how to use live coding to write your unit tests together with your code. In the next section, I'll write a function that counts the number of unique words in a list. However, words with the same letters are counted as the same word. I'll give you an example. Here's one of the tests that I might write for this function. If I pass in apple, melon, and lemon, I'm expecting two words. The answer should be two because melon and lemon have the same letters just in different orders. But when I start writing unit tests for a new function I start with the simplest scenario. So let's not start with duplicate words. Let's just have two totally separate words so that it's easy to count. Now I'm going to run that first unit test by saving it and clicking run, running it as a unit test, and it fails because it can't import the count anagrams method. I haven't written it yet. So let's... the reason that we write the test first is that it makes us think about how we want to call this function. What should be the inputs and the outputs? Now that we've thought that through, let's write a really simple version of that function. And 
and it's just going to return zero. Totally broken, but at least it'll show us that we're calling it correctly. So now if we run it again, we get a little more useful error. It expected to, it got zero. Okay, now we could go and implement that uh, function to make this test pass, but I'm going to do something slightly different. I'm going to run it in live coding mode while we make it work. So instead of just clicking on that, I'm going to click on the drop down menu next to the start button. And you can see that there's a second option here to run it as a unit test. And you can see that the test failed, the arrow's gone red, uh, and you can see the inputs and the outputs. So let's make that pass with the simplest code that could possibly work. Let's just count the number of words in the list. Okay, so now we're returning two, and you can see that the test passed. Okay, and if we save it and go back here, we can run it again, and we see that the test passes. Let's add a more interesting unit test. We'll copy the existing unit test and this time we're going to put in a duplicate word so duplicate words whoops words uh, and we'll have two copies of melon remember we're counting the unique words so melon should only be counted once plus apple makes the expected answer two but if we run that test we see that we've got one of the test fails, expected to, got three, because it's just counting the number of words in the list. Let's see what it looks like in this mode. You can see that on one side, uh, we've got the three words coming in, it's returning three, but we've also got the other test that we wrote. So we'd like to tidy it up a little bit and only run one unit test at a time. It's a little less confusing that way, especially with more complicated tests. So the way to do that is to convince Eclipse to just run one test method. So I hit Control F9 and it gives me a list of all the test methods. I double click the one I want and it just runs that one. Okay, and now it added a run configuration here and if we go over to the live coding and click on the drop down you can see that here's the new run configuration so we select that one and now it's only running the one test so now let's make that test method work pass okay so to count unique things, a set is usually a useful thing. So we're going to call this the set of anagrams. Start out with an empty set. We go through the loop of all the words for word in words. And we add each word to the set. So now if we look over here at it running, you can see that the first iteration it adds apple to the set, second iteration adds melon, and for the third iteration melon's already in the set so nothing changes. Okay, and then to make it pass, instead of returning the length of words, we pass the uh, we return the length of anagrams. And you can see that the arrow went green. So the tests are the test is passing. Let's take a copy of that. And instead of a second melon, we use a lemon. And we don't need the apple anymore. Whoops. So now we've got lemon and melon, they're anagrams of the same word, so we should only count them once. And we run that. We expect one, we got two. Let's see what it looks like in live coding mode. There we are. 
So melon and lemon, they both get added to the list, to the set. So what we're going to do is change word to be sorted. The letters in word should all be sorted. So there, now it's Elmno and the other one. Ah, but we can't add that to the set, so we have to put that back together into a string. Okay, and now you can see that both of them sort into Elmno, and so the set only contains one item and the test passes. Now, the next feature we want to add is to treat upper and lower case letters the same. So we'll make melon and lemon capitalized and see what that looks like. Oh, change the name. run that one test. Again, we expect one, we got two over in live coding mode. We can see that they are sorting differently. Now we get Melno and Lemno uh, because the uppercase letters in the ASCII table the, all the uppercase letters come before all the lowercase letters, so they sort differently now. How do we do? How do we fix that? Well, we can say word equals lower. Sorry, word equals word dot lower. So now they're in lower case. Ah, but we need to change to lowercase before we do the sorting. So if I just slide it up there. Now, they're both in lowercase, they both go to Elmno, and we get one item in the set, and the test passes. The last feature I want to add is to handle foreign words properly. So, if we use, for an example, the German word for street. One way to spell it is like that, with two S's. And another way is with a special character. It looks like that. And it means the same thing. So if I run that, of course, it doesn't know that they're the same thing, so it counts them separately. But let's run it over here in live coding mode. And luckily, Python will help us out because it's got a special string method called casefold, which does exactly what we want. Oops, there we go. Uh, and you can see that now the, low, the capital S is still converted to lowercase, but now this special character is converted to two S's. They look the same, and the test passes. Live tests are also available in the Emacs mode. So if I switch to Emacs and then open up the file we were working on, I can launch live pi mode. It doesn't actually do anything right now because it doesn't have uh, any statements in the at the module level. So instead we want to drive it using the unit tests we just wrote. So I hit the driver command and I want to use the unit test module and the test I want to run is in test anagrams dot anagrams test 
and the method is test foreign. We'll just use the last one we wrote. And here you can see the inputs to the method from the unit test, the actual iteration through the loop a couple of times. So it's exactly the same display as we saw. And each time you add a test method to the test class, you can just switch the driver command. So if I want to view a different test method, I hit, oh, go back. Yeah, control C, escape D. Up arrow gives me the last one, and I change it to change um, duplicate words. And there's the other one that I did. OK. So I actually find it easier in Emacs than in Eclipse, because I don't have to do all the tidy up at the end. Remember, if you want to try this yourself, Go to donkirkby.github.com and download one of the versions of the live coding in Python and let me know what you think of it.